this is quite a momentous occasion given that some of you probably know the troubles that Dominic's had over the last couple of years. Um, and for that, I just want to sort of give in this public forum just thank a few people, including Dave, Jenny Lappin, Elaine Marsh, and um, Chris Endy in the GRS, and also Tom and Louise in the International Student Office. So, um, Dominic first came to JCU in 2007 and made herself known to me because I was giving a lecture on Paleozoic corals, and she turned up and said, I actually have one, and I'm like, yeah, don't talk crap. She produced a glucose coral for me to look at, and I was like, all right, I've never seen one of those. Um, she was obviously very mad keen about corals. <laughs> she was obviously mad keen about corals and did a minor project with myself um, with assistance from Alison Bailey um, and Andrew Baird, and, um, and then went on to do a PhD, which we're going to hear all about today. So I'll pass the floor to Dominic. Yeah, thanks, Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I study inter and intraspecific variation in gold bleaching, which is within and around corals. Um, so there's hmm? recent evidence that we're facing the sixth mass extinction on Earth. Um, you can see the extinction magnitude, so the percentage of species going extinct. And this is the order. And the 75 percentile mark has always been what, how they distinguish mass, late, or, excuse me, mass extinction events and background variation. Uh, so you can see the scleractinian corals are already about one-third of the species are facing extinction. Um, so the drivers of declines in coral cover. Disease has been one, uh, swept through the Caribbean and put three species in local extinctions. Eutrophication, so nutrient runoff along with pollution, uh, lowers baseline health. And cyclones and hurricanes, which in degrade reefs, wipe them out. Destructive fishing practices, which over time can cause local damage. And then what I study is the mass leach units that occur. So you can see these are all mass bleachings. Um, coral bleaching has been well known in literature for over a century, but when it happens like this over large scales and affecting a lot of species, we call it mass bleaching. So common induced coral bleaching is. <sighs> Continuous and affecting more regions. You can see the year on the x-axis and the number of provinces affected on the y-axis. Um, what this shows is since about the 1985, there's been bleaching in provinces every year, uh, culminating in the 1998 event where 16% of the world's reefs died. So what is coral bleaching? Um, it's been vaguely described in literature. For instance, all corals had become pale, some even colorless. Bleached corals were alive and in, in good condition, although their tissues had been rendered colorless by loss of neonatology xanthelli. And one that's quoted very often is that bleaching is loss of symbiotic algae, loss of algal pigments, or both. Um, the issue with this is that the loss in algal pigments is much easier recoverable than loss of symbiotic algae. And when bleaching occurs, it's almost always the loss of symbiotic algae that is occurring. So what you can see here is a healthy coral with xanthelli in the gastrodermal cells within the tissues, which often gives the coral its color. And then on a bleached coral, you can actually see the skeleton through the tissues, which gives it the white appearance. And it can revert back to a healthy coral if the stressor stops, or if the stressor persists or is too severe, then they're likely to die and get covered in filaments of algae. The bleaching is a general stress response. Everything from aerial exposure, disease, herbicides, light, um, but what I want to focus on is temperature, which has been focused on by several researchers. And that is because mass bleaching is expected to occur when the temperature goes one degree above the mean maximum summer temperature. Um, now that's an old one from Joe Keel and Co's 1977. And Reese and Gary and started using bleaching hotspots where lo locations are going to come. So you can see on the x-axis here is the year. On the y-axis is the sea surface temperature. This is for French Polynesia. And the big arrows correspond to bleaching events, so you can see that they're living close to their upper thermal limits. Um, so this next is from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association, NOAA, previously called. Um, so this is about healthy, normal temperatures here, and it goes all the way up to five, and this is where it's cold, and this is where it's getting hotter. So this is for the 1998 event, um, and you can see that in the Galapagos, where it reached five degree heating weeks, it was 
significant reaching and mortality, and they almost had local extinctions of three species there compared to the Great Barrier Reef, which was lesser affected than the 98 event. I think the 2002 event was a bigger event for us here. Um, but NOAA's been using the degree heating week, but recently they said that four degree heating weeks is when corals are expected to bleach instead of one. So there's different scenarios for coral reef bleaching. So this bar represents thermal thresholds of corals, and this is the temperature increasing. So the first one is that there's constant coral bleaching thresholds, and all the corals will die, essentially, which we found even since the earliest bleaching events, there's been inter-specific inter variation for bleaching. Which is, um, so the second scenario is that there's different bleaching thresholds, for instance, among species depths and locations. So you can see the different thermal thresholds there, with temperature still rising above it. And then the third scenario is that there's changes in bleaching thresholds attributable to the acclimation evolution, where they actually rise above the increased thermal expectancy. So interspecific variation in bleaching susceptibility, you can see an acropore next to a posthopore. The acropore is bleached and the posthopore is gone. There's intraspecific variation in bleaching susceptibility, where this is all the same species, but all these species have bleached, whereas this one hasn't. It's mostly thought to be due to microclimates around the corals. Also, there is fluorescent proteins, microsporin like amino acids. There's many different things that cause intrinsic variability. And there's also temporal variation in bleaching susceptibility for acropore and montipore. This data is from French Polynesia. You can see the year on the x-axis and the bleaching incident, so the percentage of colonies that bleached on the y-axis. And it's just showing that slowly over time, less of them are bleaching. And now this could either be caused to the weak members of the species or genera in this case being wiped out and leaving the strong ones to survive, or it could show acclimation or adaptation. So my overall project aim is to define bleaching and to explore extrinsic and intrinsic variation of bleaching susceptibility within and among corals. We want to see if there's something for natural selection to work on. My specific objectives was intraspecific variation in zooxanthellae densities for acropora and millipore, um, to compare natural variation in zooxanthellae densities to proportional declines, and to quantify the individual variation of bleaching susceptibility within and between two common coral species, and to explore interspecific inter variation of bleaching susceptibility and mortality. <clears throat> so, my first chapter I looked at interspecific variation of seasonal densities for acropora and millipore. Um, this was also a methods comparison, so I just used my little piece of coral here to show you what we did. Um, there's two methods to actually remove <coughs> the tissue from the coral so that you can get those mean seasonal counts. Uh, the first is with either an airbrush or a water pick, and you just basically get the tissue off the coral that way and you can use a homogenate and do Susan Belly counts under a microscope from there. Or the other method is where you can actually dissolve away the skeleton leaving the tissue and only the tissue there. <laughs> and then again that gets homogenized and looked under a microscope to, to, to determine mean Susan Belly densities. Yeah, so the study sites for this one was Pioneer Bay, Cattle Bay, and Southwest Polaris on Orpheus Island and Polaris Island respectively. And we used acropora and millipora, so there's 30 colonies at each location. We took two branches and did one branch for the calcification method and the other branch with the airbrush method to compare them. And what we found is that the decalcification method always produced significantly higher results than the airbrushing, and that trends between locations are fairly consistent there. Um, the main reason for this, we think, is that the acropora coil that we used has perforated skeleton, so the tissue can actually get into the skeleton. So by dissolving away the skeleton, you're getting more of the tissue that's there instead of just brushing the surface, so to speak. Um, but we wanted to look at why there's that variation between um, locations. The Southwest Polaris had significantly higher by both methods than either of the other two. And it's likely that there's a nutrient flow from here. Um, this is a passage where a lot of animals do migration and everything like that. It's very deep waters, whereas here it's both shallow water. So it's likely that there's more nutrients here affecting the zooxanthellae densities. Um, we also compared the time to complete average zooxanthellae density measurements. Um, so for the decalcification, the tissue removal took up to five days, well, dissolving the skeleton did, but it was very limited handling time. It ended up to be about two to four minutes per sample 
Whereas with the airbrush, oops, it took about five to ten minutes for each sample to get it all out of there. <clears throat> Surface area determination. Again, for the calcification method, say this is just tissue, and all I did was mark off an area that I knew was a surface area and then did it that way. Whereas with the airbrushing, what we had to do, there's various methods to determine surface area, but what we did was the aluminum foil method, um, which took a while to wrap the foil perfectly around there, and then you have to make a calibration curve for that. Um, homogenization was about the same time for either method as we're doing counts in our mastometer. Um, but the total time is about halved by the decalcification method compared to airbrushing, which is very fortunate if you have a lot of samples to do. It really does save heaps of time. Um, so, to summarize, the decalcification method produced significantly higher means and filly densities than airbrushing, likely due to the perforated skeletons. And trends between locations were consistent between methods and likely due to nutrient fluxes. Um, yeah. And decalcification cuts processing time in half. So my second chapter is comparison of natural variations in Susan Philly densities to proportional declines in Susan Philly densities. So this is adapted from Faguni et al. 1999, where the month is on the bottom axis and the mean Susan Philly densities here. You can see that through the year it does fluctuate quite heavily. So it might be interesting if bleaching may be indistinguishable from background variations. Um, so I used 148 published works to answer this question with greater than 430 entries. Uh, taxonomy and morphology data were from Jerome, and where possible, studies were separated into sublethal or lethal bleaching, and that was based on if they showed recovery of the corals that was put into sublethal, or if they said 50% or more are dead, they put into lethal bleaching. Um, I also looked at the causes of natural variations in Susan Philly densities, as well as the methods of Susan Philly density determination. Um, there are so many possible causes of variation that I did ANOVAs for each one and then looked at the F ratios to compare it. Yeah, but I'll show you the difference between healthy and bleached corals first. Um, so this is the standard error there, and this is the actual range. So you can see that the range of the healthy corals is within what we consider bleached coral densities. Also, that one million is also often quoted as the means of embedded density in corals, whereas the study found it was about a little over Five million. Um, so as I was saying, this is the F ratio graph, the F ratio up here, and then the cause here. And I'm going to focus on these first three because they're methods and they cause the most variation in these and belly densities. There's uh, 106 possible combinations of these, and 92 were used in the papers that I found. So the first one is. Uh, whether they use a whole colony and sample throughout time, or if they just use branches. And I had to separate the branching and massive because there is big differences between them. Um, so you can see the standard error there, and then the range of what we consider on whole colonies have higher using failure densities than branches do. Um, so for tissue removal, again, with the degasification and acid, or the tissue stripped from the skeleton, um, the Standard errors are shown there, but the ranges were so low there that I didn't show the bottom ones. Um, you can see again the mean season belly density counts is higher for the decastification method right, compared to airbrushing. And then there's surface area determination. Um, this is an image analyzer, which is supposed to be the most accurate method, but it's likely to vastly overestimate surface area of the corals tissue. Um, people also use calipers and volume, wax, and as vague as calculated, <laughs> and um, the aluminum foil method. Uh, it appears that wax has got the closest mean value there. So what are the trends in Susan Belly densities? So this is the proportion of colonies and natural variation, sublethal paling, sublethal bleaching, which is my Orpheus on experiment, which I'll talk about next, but I've used the Susan Belly densities from it to compare with these. Um, so natural variation has a wide range of Susan Belly densities and sublethal paling as well. Um, I'll show you more here, but that experiment really tinkered with the line of sublethal and lethal bleaching. And then lethal bleaching, which is an average of 77% loss. 
So to conclude, there's no absolute density to define bleaching. You have to use relative change because of all the natural variations and the high natural variations using belly density. So you really need to know baselines using belly density before you call it bleach. Um, natural variation can be up to 50%, um, whereas bleaching was a loss of greater than 55% of the season belly density, season belly population density, with greater than 77% likely to becoming lethal, especially if the stress it continues. Uh, monitoring needs to be consistent, non-random, and continuous. Um, one of the greatest causes of natural variation is actually intercolonial causes, so branch gradients and stuff like that. So for chapter three, I wanted to quantify individual variation and bleach susceptibility within and between two common coal species. It's a mouthful. Um, the point here is the intraspecific variation again, where all these other Members of the same species are bleaching and one is not. Um, so my study species for this were Acropora nizuda and Poslipora damacornis. Both are common and highly susceptible to bleaching events. So we'll look at methods to distinguish between bleach and healthy corals, as that was my goal, was to study with bleach these corals, and I needed to find a method that I could use in the field. Um, Zizanthella density is the most unambiguous method to use, although you have to branch sample and it can be very invasive, especially if you're on long term. It's just not an ideal method to use. Um, but I did use them for post hoc studies, so I took branch sampling along the way. Um, pigment concentrations, which can either be determined in a similar way to disease and thelar densities or can be determined from the Coral Watch bleaching card. So it's considered that if they lose two color codes there, then they're bleaching. And there's also photosynthetic yield is a good indicator of bleaching from PAM fluorometry. Um, so PAM fluorometry and the color cards were both non-invasive techniques that I could use a couple times a day as I did with the PAM fluorometry. Whereas with the Zeus and Belly densities, I only took uh, samples for every degree increase in the temperature and then on the bleaching day. Um, so the concept behind fluorescence and photosynthetic yield and the whole pan fluorometry to begin with, those coils are fluorescing there. Basically, they're accepting light at one wavelength and pushing it back out at a different wavelength. Um, so when light enters, the chlorophyll acts as an antennae. And um, it can either fluoresce, it can be used in photochemistry, such as uh, cellular respiration, or it can be dissipated as heat. And it's dissipated as heat. There's two pathways, non-photochemical quenching, MPQ and QN. MPQ happens at the antenna, and QN happens at the photosystem. So photosystem one and photosystem two. Um, so we'll look at Orpheus Island temperature stress. So this is time on the x-axis and dates, followed by temperature on the y-axis. And the arrows represent bleaching events, where this was just a minor bleaching event. Um, this is the degree heating weak line here, what it should be. Um, so what I did is I followed the 1998 event at Orpheus Island. So that's uh, the mean max is in red. And this double black bar is from my experiments, the actual temperature data. So I tried to follow it closely. And once it got up to the 31.6, which was the degree heating weak temperature, I just left them constant until they actually bleached, and I measured this for each colony. Um, so they were <laughs> placed inside aquaria and temperature control rooms, and I monitored their health via the pamphlorometry and color cards until they were determined bleached, and then they were moved to outdoor raceways where I continued monitoring their recovery. So the experimental protocols, again, there's general observations on colony condition through the color cards and the PAM fluorometry readings, which were five replicates per colony in the morning and evening. Uh, I did the dark adaptive values a little differently than most. Um, I did it an hour before the light came on in the experimental, but when they were in outdoor raceways, I actually woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning to get to them before the sunrise, so a lot of effort there. Um, the measurement of fixed colony variables, so branches were collected for Susan Billy clade and average Susan Billy densities. And uh, all the measurements were done about one to two centimeters from the tip, so right there, so it would be consistent. Um, what I found, though, was that there is massive variation within a colony, which then what I term branch sites. Um, so 
say this one could be healthy while this one's doing photo protection and one could be doing photo repair. Um, and there's also photo damaged and photo inhibited, which I'll show you a little later. Um, but what I found is that the variation from the mean photosynthetic yield, there's a high spike in the variance on the bleaching day. Um, basically, it was colony-wide loss of function that occurred. Um, and so what I had to do was take the control corals, um, the mean of those compared to the mean of other experimental corals, and follow a particular colony in time. So here you can see it's doing photo protection and photo repair, which is very common on the reefs. Um, and then it starts to being quenched to the point where it's trying to fix itself, and then it just loses function. And there's a rapid change in non-photochemical quenching levels. They're getting rid of free oxygen radicals. Um, so just briefly with the fluorescence, this is a minimum fluorescence and the control values for that and how to know if it was bleached. There's a very rapid decline in three days. Um, same with maximum fluorescence. And the ratio between these two, which is often cited as the way the person that healed many people use to determine bleaching, um, it was a consecutive decrease and it ended up being less than 0.45, whereas the healthy ones within the range of 6 to 7. And again, with the photochemical and non-photochemical quenching, they're in competition for this, so it was either high or low, depending on which measure they took. Um, what I found for these anthelia densities, um, so you can see the natural variation in the controlled corals, followed by the rapid decline that happened when corals actually bleached. It's actually a very rapid process. Um, and this is just the corals getting acclimated again to the recovery conditions. <coughs> so they ended up being about the same towards the end of the experiment, which is good 50 days after bleaching. So I compared the means using thalia density with the color and the yield to find out which is better. Um, this is for color. Sorry, there's um, controls and experiments in there. But I took the highs and then the lows from them. So for color, it was about a 50% correlation, whereas for means photosynthetic yield, it was about a 73% correlation. Um, what this shows is that if you're just doing it by color alone, you probably have to write on whether they're going to survive or not. Whereas if you use the mean uh, photosynthetic yield, it increases your accuracy about 23%. So variability in the timing of bleaching. Uh, you can see the mean values here. So one is one degree feeding link. I should have put a red line, my bad. And uh, plus the core damocornis. And these show the actual range of the corals and how long it took them to bleach. Uh, you can notice immediately that Acropora and Nazuda took less time, less time to actually bleach than plus the core damocornis. Um, so this is the variation at the degree feeding link. You can see some corals were pale to the observer. This one was already getting overrun with algae in parts of the colony. Um, this one was still nice and healthy, and, and this one's starting to be simply like bleach. Uh, same for the Pasiflora damocornis here, just to give you an idea. Um, there was less than 15% of those that had bleached by the degree heating week, though, whereas Acropora and Azuta was about half of them had bleached at the degree heating week. So the clades of zizanthelia, the type of zizanthelia that were in the corals, um, were measured. And what I found was that where they had more than one type of zizanthelia, they were likely to bleach earlier. And the zizanthelia types also span the entire range almost. Uh, it's contradictory to some findings, especially that the only coral I had with clade D bleached before the degree heating mark. Um, so to summarize, Possiflora and Damocornis took longer to bleach than Acropora and Azuta. Uh, if the experiment had stopped with a degree heating week, less than one third of all colonies would have been bleached. And Susan Thelly were rapidly expelled compared to the gradual process of natural variations. And the photosynthetic yield correlates to Susan Thelly density 23% better than color. And that the first corals to bleach had more than one type of Susan Thelly. So chapter four is to explore interspecific variation in bleaching susceptibility and mortality. Um, so susceptibility is the proportion of colonies affected, whereas mortality is the portion of colonies that have died. Um, so data were entered for susceptibility and mortality, um, where they were given in the text or determined from graphs. Um, this is from the ICRS 
presentation, uh, morphology. So I used any morphology data I had out of the whole database, and it was N for 825 susceptibility and 700 for mortality. And the morphology data was entered from growing 2,000 corals in the world. Um, so this is just a hierarchy of bleaching responses um, based on the morphology. So it's percent affected and by the morphology. Um, what we found is fairly consistent within the literature that tabular columnar branching corals were more susceptible to massive encrusting or submassive corals. Um, these were later pooled. You can also see that mortality is much higher for them as well. Um, what we found though is that within families, there's variations in the hierarchy of morphology, um, such that within acropora, massive corals were more susceptible than branching, and then fabidae, branching corals were least susceptible. Um, so what I did was looked at complete observations of bleaching events and found that there wasn't much of a difference between branching and massive corals if they actually follow the event through the whole process. Um, and then I broke down the time that people were observing. So you can see here at about five months, this is from onset of thermal stress, was a relative high for branching corals, whereas in massive corals it was a relative low. So there's a bit of observer bias if you're going out five months into it and you see all these branching corals that have died and you just haven't fully seen the full effects of the massive corals. So the overall conclusions is that intraspecific variation exists for mean zeuxanthellae densities of acropora and millipore. Uh, the proportional declines in zeuxanthellae densities are better to use than an absolute value because it requires constant monitoring because of the variations in zeuxanthellae densities happen naturally. And inter- and intraspecific variation in the timing of the bleaching response shows phenotypic plasticity, which is needed for natural, vari or, pardon me, natural selection to work on so that they can evolve and interspecific variation in the timing of the bleaching response, which also shares phenotypic plasticity. Um, so overall, what my results show is that there's plenty of phenotypic variation for natural selection to work with. So back to the scenarios for coral reef bleaching, we know that there aren't constant coral bleaching thresholds. It varies a lot. Um, we do know that there's different bleaching thresholds among species, depths, and locations. And recent research is showing that there is changes in bleaching thresholds attributable to acclimation and evolution, uh, such as the guest at all 2012 paper where they had a reversal in the bleaching susceptibility, um, where the massive coral was much more affected than tabular coral or corn growth. Um, so overall, we're looking at changes in coral reef ecosystems, if there's high emissions or low emissions. Um, what my work shows is that we may lose the weak members of the crew, but in the end, there's going to be some that survive it, and it's a way for um, natural selection to work on. Hopefully, hopefully, if we stop and help the emissions process, we can look forward to changes in coral communities, but not a complete decimation of them. Um, so my papers, uh, this first one here, when it's a galaxia, rapid and reliable estimates of Susan Dillard densities obtained the calcification of fixed sample size, the first paper I talked to you about. Um, the second paper we're hoping to have done soon, it's drafted, um, distinguishing coral bleaching from background variation in season fill density, so actually defining bleaching. Um, the third paper is interspecific variation in the timing of the bleaching response, so my work at ORP is on the research station. And then the fourth paper is Global Analysis of Bleaching Susceptibility Winners and Losers. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Loy at all 2001, but we're basically redoing that and seeing how it compares now. Um, so I'd just like to thank the ARC Center of Excellence, especially my supervisors who've stood by me for a lot, um, my field volunteers, and everyone that's offered me criticism and listened to me. And <laughs> And it's on your Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Dolly? Can I go back to the Orpheus Island experiment? Yeah. Um, where you showed that map of Polaris and whatever. Did you take the corals when you did the Zuzanthel numbers? Did you take the corals from a fixed depth? 
Yeah, I actually lassoed the corals with flagging tape because there was terrible visibility on the day and made the tape a certain length so I knew I couldn't go past that. Uh -huh. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Any questions from you too? Can you hear us? Like They're having a good conversation about it, though, aren't they? <laughs> data from your yeah of course I just wanted to yeah it's a bit different than how it normally comes across huh yeah yeah okay so oh so they're all from Acropornis sorry yeah it's all Acropornis yeah Apostoports um, oh, they there's only two of them that had a different clay and C1 was something else um, and those, actually, I meant to say that, the, of seven corals that had these different clays, they all bleached within the first three days, so it was noticeable compared to the other ones. Okay, all right. Yeah. So, the time to bleach in relation to degree of heating weeks, we're seeing, sorry, I can't see it, C2, yeah, C3, yeah. and then the C1 and D. Yeah, so this one was, C3 was greater than C2, the C1 and D, and then C2 is greater than C3. Okay, so yeah. that's the dominant clay, and there's no, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and they're likely bleached the dom or the subdominant type that was in there, but there was one coral that actually bleached the dominant type. I think that was a C2 coral. And it, again, what was the timing of it? I mean, I can see the timing, but in terms of. Yeah, so this is the degree heating week at zero. Okay, so after they reached the temperature that they needed to yeah. bleach for one week? One degree. Yeah, so I took them up to 31.6 over 18 days, yep. and then once they were there, I just left them constant until they actually bleached, determined by the same sign and values. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Just, where were no, the corals right. collected? Sorry? Where were the corals collected? From Pioneer Bay, Little Pioneer Bay, both sets, yeah. Hey, Dominic, your, um, uh, your database you put together was, was chapter four. Yeah, um, yeah, that was incomplete, as is. Okay, yeah. I was wondering if you. Did you factor in how severe the stress was in there? Yeah, the degree heating week. Um, so you controlled for that? Yeah, well, the one with the morphologies is at a constant degree heating week. Right. I think at about 20 degree heating weeks is what it came down to. Okay. Yeah. So it's fairly high. Yeah. yeah. All right, if that's, if that's it, we'll just thank Dominic again. Mm -hmm. Thank you.